You're listening to the Build to Rent Podcast. Build to Rent Podcast. Welcome to the Build to Rent Show. Steve Olson here along with Chase Levitt. We've got more stuff live from the Build to Rent trenches to talk to you about today. Some of it may be useful. Some of it may be basic and you're wondering why you're listening, but I can promise you it's all real. <laughs> it's all authentic and it's happening uh, right now. Uh, Chase and I were joking yesterday. We got into this big discussion about a land deal in Phoenix and we thought, you know, we should just talk about this in front of the microphones. Maybe people will will like it. So we'll see. You can go to b2rshow.com to send us comments and questions and hate mail. You can follow us on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. There we go. All right. That's an intro. Nice <laughs> what? job, Steve. There you yeah. go. And I've been told by Gavin to to stay like a couple <clears throat> inches from the mic today. So I'm going to try to do that. Yeah. You're you like, should do that too. You're like a half you're like a half of an inch from it. I know, but my audio is way better. Listeners right. send send a comment into the B2R show and let let me know how much better I sound than Chase cuz I stay by the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um we were in Phoenix just handling business a couple of weeks ago, which you and I are going to Boise next week. Yep. We like to pick all the markets that are getting all the hate in the media right now. <laughs> so Chase and I are going to Boise next week. We might have some good stuff to say. Um, and I'll actually be in Phoenix the week after that, going to a multifamily, just like an afternoon thing. And then mm-hmm. I got to handle some stuff on our there you go. little problem project in South Phoenix um, that mm-hmm. I got to go deal with. Yeah. Okay, so, and maybe we'll talk about that, but that's, sometimes problems are so specific that it's not necessarily worth talking about, because nobody ever is going to have that problem ever again, if you understand that one, you really understand that one. Okay, so, anyways, we're, we're having this debate of, of this land deal. It's in Apache Junction, Arizona, which used to be known as the, uh, the, the trailer park meth factory of East Phoenix, which is changing a lot now. And we like the deal, right? It's right off of the 60. Um, it's near brand new uh, single family developments. It's it's just probably, I think we timed it once, seven minutes down the 60 into like the core of Mesa and all the commercial and retail mm-hmm. and amenities and all that kind of stuff. We really like the deal. Um, but we're getting all this conflicting information as to whether or not it works. So one of these land brokers we met with last week in Phoenix made a good observation, I thought, because it's been so easy to get frustrated and mad at the land sellers over the last couple of years, right? You want to make an offer on some land. They're not going to give you entitlements. They're not going to give you hardly any due diligence. It's closed in 30 or 60 days and you own the land or we keep your earnest money. You don't have any assurances that you're going to be able to develop the land the way that you want to and carry out, out your plan. So um, have we seen that loosen up? I mean, you've been chasing some dirt. Are our sellers a little more flexible? Like I might give you more time or a better price. What's your vibe that you're getting out there right yeah, now? Yeah, and when, when you say chasing dirt, for me, I kind of have just scraping the surface. I feel like I know just enough, right? I'm not considered one of our fig land agents or land guys, but I've been, I kind of have a little knack or a little, um, I don't know what you call it, that I enjoy just looking at, at dirt and what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we talk about this Apache Junction deal and it's quite interesting because when you kind of give it the, I don't know what you call it, the initial look or the sniff test as far as the, what they want in cost for the acreage. And then the next thing, what are we going to look at? So we look at the cost of the land and then we want to look at rents, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so those, those, those are kind of the first two things that come to mind for me. And when you see the land cost <clears throat> that makes sense or that are low for what works for you in that deal, depend on what you're wanting to do or what you're allowed to do there, whether it's single family homes for rent, townhomes for rent, or apartments, you can figure out what your unit cost is going to be for just raw dirt. And you should have an idea if you've been in the game long enough on where you've been with raw dirt per unit. And then you look at the rents. And if the rents equal X amount, and we know in Arizona that Phoenix Metro, like we're talking about where the rents are around 2,000 
um, give or take, or, or, or more, depending on the unit type, right? Mm-hmm. And when we say 2,000, we're thinking three-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath, mm-hmm. townhome-style unit, two-story, maybe three-story. And we could probably throw some different um, unit type in there that's going to meet that 2,000 or more. But that's what we've been seeing is the $2,000 per month in rent. And so when we looked into this Apache deal, we're like, okay, it, it passes those two things. The cost for the dirt has come down a little bit or softened. Or for that deal, I should say, it still makes sense. So let's take a, another step further. And so for our listeners and that I want to talk about a little bit with you is where would we look? So when we do our initial pro forma, we do our breakdown, what do we look towards next? Well, it's going to be development cost, right? When it comes to horizontal cost and then also vertical cost, what it's going to cost to improve the dirt, which could be huge. That could be a deal killer. And that's what we saw with this piece here is there's a bunch of trenching and piping that's quite expensive that needs to happen that we need to account for or factor in in order to make this deal work. And so we penciled that number. We have a pretty good idea of what our vertical vertical costs are going to be because we've been building down there in, in that market. So we know uh, price per door. And so that's kind of the initial starting place. The other thing too, once you understand that first initial back of the napkin or sniff test that, hey, the land cost or the unit per a door cost works versus the rents. My next move would do a pro, we do a pro forma. So there's two different pro formas. There's yeah, yeah. a there's a um, development pro forma that's quite in depth, and then there's also our our basic fig pro forma investor pro forma investor yeah. pro forma. If we were to go sell this, they would want to see okay what it, what type of unit are they buying, townhome style or is it a stack style three bedroom or two bedroom and what are those rents yeah and then we'd start to factor in the expenses which are pretty standard with a lot of those expenses but some of those are going to vary uh-huh got to make sure we're not missing anything in that investor pro what's the main boogeyman on expenses that that keeps you up at night that we've recently talked about is probably taxes yeah um and you can buffer and be conservative there that's that's a safe way to go about it but your taxes are going to vary not only from state to state or city to city, but they're pretty specific. Yeah. City to city. I was, um, to please continue in just a second, but I had to call the Maricopa County tax assessor last week and, and get some color on how they're going to tax. This is a property in Glendale, the one in Glendale. Right. Uh huh. And, um, the, the challenge that I've seen uh, number one, like these, these tax assessors, many of them are happy to, to talk to you on the phone and they're very helpful. They're just not very helpful <laughs> because they, they don't want to get in a position where you're coming back at them, screaming, suing them that they told you something about property taxes that you relied on. And now you are going bankrupt because you can't carry the property. And I, I had to have it. As, she wanted to know, and this was helpful I think this is going to vary no matter where you're developing. The only way to do it is to call the assessor and start learning how they do taxes in the area. And so I called her and this got as specific as me not being able to just say it's in Glendale, but rather what's the tax ID number. So I had to get the parcel ID number and she looked it up and said, well, there's this rate and then there's this secondary rate and here's how we get to all of it. So that was very clear. That was very helpful. The problem was, is what do you apply it against? Because they have an assessed value. And from there, they do their percentages and their calculations to get to the tax. How do you know what the the assessed value is going to be? I mean, I feel like sometimes the assessor just licks their finger and puts it in the in the wind every year and just comes out with assessed values. Many would argue that it's more sophisticated than that. I would argue kind of (laughs) not, but um, probably the... This we talk about this like when do you push your luck? When do you push it to make a deal work? Versus when are you really careful? And you can be too careful, right? Yeah, to yeah. where you're the guy watching deals go by. Yeah, that work, and that's hard. That's tempting. So 
a lot of people would say, well, what's the value? Like what back into a cap rate value or look at the comps and make that be your assessed value. And the well, they're going to assess it for less. Great. I hope they do. But the only way to really be safe, because you're kind of thinking about it, what if I wanted to get into a fight about this and appeal it, the assessed value? If I went off a of full value, right, then then I probably can't lose there. And if my numbers work at that, it's probably it's probably doable. So tangent, but I had that discussion with them last week. No, thanks for bringing that up because it helps our listeners know kind of where we've been and what we've been through when you try to get specific on understanding the assessed value and what the taxes are and what their tax rate is. Yeah. It's really, they're really cagey about it. And when you actually find the right person and know who to call, they don't answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or when they do answer, they're, they give you some. You're going to be a pro at, at bureaucratic phone menus, yeah. by the way, like press one for this. And then you get there and they're like, oh, well, that's so-and-so. Let me transfer you. And then you get disconnected yeah. on the transfer. Like you got to want it. But it's important to do. But that's your number one way of being able to find out what the tax rate is and understanding it. And if you can't, which sometimes it's hard, there's a couple of secrets, smart asset website. I wouldn't say it's 100% accurate, but they could get you in the ballpark a little yeah, bit. They're pretty useful. Smartasset.com. Yeah, yeah. For finding uh, property taxes, but I've, know, I've known to see them be off. But if you want to just a starting point, they're a good starting point. And then you can just look at the comps on the MLS, um, on Zillow, Rentler, just to see that product type. Yeah. Whether it's multifamily, fourplex, which we I've had a hard time finding because not a lot of people do. Do they assess a fourplex the same as a single family versus a, a yeah. 50 unit apartment? Yeah, yeah you got to learn all that. Ideally, you'd want the fourplex or whatever product type you're doing right. there. So for, let's take this Apache Junction deal. It's going to be individual PUD townhomes, not the fourplexes. Planned urban development. Yeah, that are being offered at a discounted rate that make that deal work. And so the nice thing about knowing that is we can just go to the MLS. And the nice thing about the Arizona MLS is they have uh, rentals on there as well. So you can see what they're being taxed from a rental standpoint. But you can just go to a townhome style within that area and see what's been sold or what's active and what those taxes are being listed on the MLS. It's just a comparable That way. should give you a good idea. And th so yeah. that's how I backed into the taxes because the taxes can vary. When it comes to property management, we know what that fee is because we work with a property management company. Or if you don't have one, figure out who you're going to work with and see what they charge. Put that number in your pro forma. Clean and maintenance is pretty basic because these are newer. So that's pretty, pretty low and it's been pretty true. We've seen what that's been first couple of years. That's what we put in there. So yeah, it's just the taxes and the rents, which are huge. Putting together that investor pro forma. And so that's what we did for Apache Junction, right? Mm -hmm. And with where we needed to be, um, it was quite interesting that it cash flowed and the cap rate was a six cap, which to me is pretty doable. I think we probably need to be pushing closer to mid sixes to get people's attention. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like but, to see that. But a six cap, I felt pretty good. And I felt pretty good with where the rents were, with what I was getting. Um, also had uh, someone with the FIG development team that got his eyes on it, that put in the rents that I agreed with, that I felt were conservative but accurate. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see that that investor pro forma was like, man, I th this should sell. But then we going back to our other development pro forma, it didn't work. And so why didn't it work? Let's talk about a couple things. Meaning, or, or, or sorry, at least it doesn't work right now. Like an end investor, a doctor that wants to buy a fourplex, and that's what you and I deal a lot in. It works for him, but for the de developer and builder team, it's a loss. Yeah, let's just say- Which we, means they're going to have to market way up, let's and just, now it yeah. doesn't work for the doctor. Let's just say for the- the investor pro forma, the, the doctor's going to see or whoever's yeah. wanting to invest per unit. That was at 287. That's a decent price for a, a three bed, two yeah. and a half bath townhome. Yeah. It's tough to see that. And I, I think there's the comp, value in there. Yeah, yeah. There's value. There's equity. It's cash flowing at, I think it was either six and a quarter or 6.25 of a assumed interest rate mm -hmm. when it was finished. And it's cash flowing, which is hard to find in this market. 
So that's why I started getting excited about it. And so it, it worked with that pro forma. So flipping over to the development pro forma, why didn't it work? And as we dove into it a little bit further, it didn't work because it was, it didn't make the builder any money. Like the end line item per unit or overall, I don't think there's any, is either negative or no money to be made. And there's a couple things that we can talk about that came to my mind. It was the TPT, the horizontal. Tell everybody what the TPT is, if you would. It's called the, uh, and, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but transaction privilege tax. Something that they it, charge in Arizona. Or is it just Maricopa County? It it's says, stupid, whatever it is. Yeah, I, it, Arizona Department of Revenue. They, yeah. they hereby give you the privilege to transact. I hate the name, transaction privilege yeah. tax. <laughs> we put in our pro forma a conservative number at 5% in there, which basically just took all the profit out and killed the deal. Mm-hmm. We're looking into that further to, to make to, to see if we're too Wasn't high. it like $2 million? Yeah. So we're looking at that for, further to see if, hey, are we too high on that? I think we've got something wrong. So we're going to look into the TPT tax. The horizontal we've looked into, we feel pretty good about it because we talked about the piping, the trenching. You don't want to mess that up. You got to factor in, okay, what's going to cost to develop the site and be accurate there. And then the vertical cost. I think that was a big thing too, is the vertical cost from what we've had in previous projects. Um, it still hasn't softened enough to make it work. The, ver- the vertical costs were too high still. So we we get that directly from our construction team and and they plug in that number so that we can use in that development pro forma and that's where they need to be and it was it was too high so is what i'm trying to say is costs have not come down yet to make that deal work and it was kind of a bummer because i've never seen a investor pro forma look good and then our development pro forma just not work and it's still something that we're going to massage and look at closer to see if we can make it work I like that dirt, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Those were three line items there that you want to pay close attention to if you're looking to develop your own project and do your own site there to make sure you get those numbers right. Because, I mean, it's got to be a win for everybody, right? The builder's Mm got to make money. The investor's got to like the numbers. It's got to make sense for them. we got to be able to, to sell it. Well, the market is still sorting itself out right now. And, and when you have this volatile interest rate environment, it's, it's tough for these land prices, these material prices, et cetera, to find their footing. And I, I spoke to the builder we work with um, most and um, I was, I, I, we have to, we, we've got some fourplexes coming up here in Utah that we're going to offer kind of like what Chase and I have been saying to the doctors and the dentists of the world, people that want to just buy a fourplex and they had suggested some initial pricing and we just, we're going, we feel like prices should come down at some point. And you know, the answer I got was lumber has come way, way, way down, but that's being eaten up by other by components. Other yeah. Uh, right. Steel related components, HVAC um, components, for example, now your air conditioning condenser has to be way more efficient and that just costs a lot more. Um, so that's going to chew up some of your lumber savings. And so it's just really, really uneven still. And when you can't count on uh, interest rates being about where you need them to be, you, it's a gamble. It's hard to build. Yeah. It's hard to do this stuff. Yeah. And you'd think that the labor costs are going to come down. But from my understanding, I don't think they've dropped tremendously, right? I think they're getting a little more competitive and you're starting to get um, different subs that are starting to call the builder and saying, hey, I need a job or I'm, I'm available. Yeah. So that's starting to free up a little bit. But I don't think that's dropped drastically. I still think there's work to be done. There's a lot of uh, multifamily and a lot of construction still happening, at least in the markets that that we find ourselves in. Yeah. To where that ha- hasn't totally dropped. It's yeah, it's come off a little from what I've seen, but the materials are not. I mean, I... yeah. I had uh, lunch with a an, an old childhood friend the other day who's now the uh, director of sales for uh, Sun Pro, and they're a maybe he doesn't want me to say this on a podcast, I don't know, but they're a big building supplier, 
and he's in charge of their garage doors and insulation. And I said, what's going on with you guys in the garage door and insulation department? And he said, oh, they're still relatively busy. And I said, what about lumber? And he said, it's dead. And, and I think that's kind of a reflection of where we're at in the <coughs> supply glut. When you, when you see, do you think it was probably summer of 2022 when, when many of the builders in these hot markets freaked out and said, we're not doing any more starts? We're, we're not going to look for more deals. Yes, late summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you think about that context, like if they kept working on what they already had, kind of for lack of a better term, what they were already pregnant on. Yeah. Um, they're not ordering lumber anymore, but they're going to need to be ordering garage doors. And this is going to gradually filter through. Trickle down, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to see how it sorts out. I mean, a lot of people are of the belief that this we're not going to get a calm environment not that real estate's ever calm but we're not going to get that until they stop raising these rates and they're not going to stop that until there's enough blood yeah <laughs> and i think if i'm just have a gut that if if mortgage if rates are high right your your price per month is is just too high for that person to to want to go out and buy something yeah and if you have your rental rate that's significantly lower than that, we're going to see renters in the market. And so yeah. in some of our locations, we've seen a little bit of a tabling off or softening with yeah. the rents. Yeah. When or, or do we start to see that climb back up a little bit if rates stay up because that monthly payment's up and we got renters or more renters? Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting to see over the next couple months. We're not doing our pro formas based off of, hey, the rent's going to be higher, right? We don't want yeah. to do that. We want to be conservative with where it's actually at or where it could be trending. Yeah. But be conservative. Yeah. How long can you have inflation and these high costs and have rents come down? I mean, we've ob obviously seen that that's possible, but at some point household formation has to start again. It, if you're in a market where people are moving now, you could, you could have a situation where the market has become so expensive that they're not doing that anymore. And this lag of supply coming onto the market is basically creating an imbalance between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And you've got to digest that for a while. But I think you're right. Long term, if it's cheaper to rent than to buy, you're going to have more renters and, and, and things eventually even out. But it does take a couple of years. I mean, think about properties you've got right now. You've got leases on them. Oh, rents are down. Well, if you're a renter and you've still got 19 months left on your lease, do you want to break it? And, and it's, so all that has to come through and filter through the market before we can see something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I love that 30 year fixed rate debt that you lock in at a rate in the high threes <laughs> 18 months ago. Right. Oh yeah. If you did that, then this is uh, not that much of a stressful situation. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I heard a guy say the other day that real estate is pretty simple. Um, sell or buy when rates are high and people are, are scared, you know, keep cash and sell when rates are really low. Maybe an oversimplification, but not so much. Yeah. So then you're timing the market and we yeah. all, we've had discussions about timing the market. Yeah. Something yeah. to think about, but yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens with Apache Junction. We'll keep you posted to our listeners. And if you guys have anything that we're missing, by all means, uh, Call us, send us an email, let us know. But yeah. that's kind of just the, the basic starting point that we wanted to just get out there and talk about. And as we vet through it a little bit more, we'll keep you posted. Yeah, hopefully our guy, Brian, who you listeners don't know, but hopefully he's wrong on the transaction privilege tax. Come on, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he watches this. So we could just bag on him. Just maybe, kidding. Maybe, yeah. you never know. I had, <laughs> maybe. He's I a good a, dude. But I do hope he's wrong on that. And I think he hopes he's wrong. I had Bjorn. I want to give a shout out to Bjorn up in Idaho. He he gave us a compliment. He listens and, and he no kidding. Yeah, he appreciates what we have to say. So Bjorn, if you're listening up there in Idaho, hope you're doing well and and thanks for tuning in. Yeah, keep slinging. We're gonna be there next week, and I've noticed a big pickup on those job sites with a lot of the builders in Idaho slowing down. Now our guys have a lot more access to subs, whereas before, I yeah. mean. Yeah. These subs were walking around with their pinkies out, drinking. They were so snobby. You could not get them to come to your job yeah. site. So that, yeah, there yeah. it's freed up yeah. a little bit, which is good. But I, there's always, it's like one thing gets better, another thing gets worse. It's a, 
you know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. Everybody, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time on the Build to Rent Show. Thanks for listening to the Build to Rent podcast. You are now just a few clicks away from joining our community of Build to Rent investors. All you have to do is follow our show on Facebook, LinkedIn, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. You can also watch this episode and more by subscribing to the Build to Rent podcast on YouTube. The information presented in this podcast is general in nature. Nothing in this presentation should be construed as financial advice or recommendations for any particular situation. The hosts are only licensed to provide advice and services in the states where they are specifically licensed. And listeners should seek the advice from an appropriately licensed professional in the area where they invest. The examples presented in this presentation are for illustration only, and no guarantee that similar results can be achieved, since the facts, circumstances, and participants are all different.